I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guest today is Angus Scott, founder and CEO of ArtClear, a company that aims to bring technology to bear on a market whose continuing reliance on the physical, the personal and the face-to-face speaks volumes about the absence of that ingredient crucial to all good business, namely trust. Trust in this case that the buyers and sellers are who they say they are, and above all, that the artwork in question is what it purports to be. I'm speaking here, of course, of the peculiar culture and economics of the global art market. Angus, thanks very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, Dominic. Could we put some um, some numbers on the market that you're addressing? How large is this market? How active uh, is the market that you at ArtClear are looking to address? And I'm talking here as a numbers of uh, of participants, numbers of transactions, revenues, profits, where it happens, um, and its structure, I suppose. Yeah, sure. So it, it, it's a very large market. I mean, not large in the sense of the global financial services industry, <clears throat> but in its own terms, extremely large. Um, and you know, to a certain extent, unquantified. Um, art is kind of, by definition, a very personal thing, and there's very valuable objects um, whose location or even existence isn't known about. Um, but broadly speaking, um, you know, so, some interesting metrics. Um, there's something like uh, 1,300 uh, art museums globally, and about 9,000 major private collections, corporate or private collections, and, and you know, who knows um, what other works beyond that. Um, it's estimated um, by EY that uh, ultra high net worth individual holdings of art total about 1.7 trillion. Um, and in terms of the market itself, um, uh, there's, there's a report produced every year um, uh, by uh, an economist um, sponsored by UBS, um, which estimates that global sales are around 65 billion, something like 45 million transactions, um, uh, sale transactions go, going through that. Um, and um, and then, of course, in terms of other participants, there's something like 3,000 major international dealers, um, you know, several auction houses, you know, uh, tens of auction houses, obviously dominated by the big names, Sotheby's and Christie's and Bonhams and Phillips, but many other regional houses, um, a large number of shippers in the region of a couple of hundred of, of big shipping companies. Uh, and then a whole host of others, um, advisors, insurers, lawyers, um, one sort or another. So it's a large and complex um, ecosystem. Sounds a bit like the securities market with all those uh, intermediaries. And I assume the 80-20 rule applies with those big auction houses accounting for the majority of that 65 billion you referred to. Would that be right? Um, it's actually, um, in, in terms of sales, it's about 55% uh, goes through dealers and about 45% goes through auction houses. But then within the proportion held by auction houses, yes, I think yeah, that 80-20 rule does apply. Um, but the primary market, the market of distribution of new works is largely handled by the dealer community. And how's the art market performed as an investment? How's it performed relative to other asset classes? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's because it, it, it's not primarily a financial investment, as, as you know. As you know, art, art has um, aesthetic use value in, in its own right, but of course, you know, these are very valuable objects, and they do appreciate in in value over time. Um, and there's various indices around, and depending on which one you look at, um, over the long term, art has performed somewhere between corporate bonds and equities. So you know, four, five, six, seven, eight percent annualized returns. And crucially, it has a very low correlation to other financial assets. So as, a, as an investment, um, it, it is potentially very attractive. Um, the downside, of course, is the transaction cost, which I'm sure we'll get to in a little bit. Maybe we can start to compare it to cryptocurrencies as well as an alternative <laughs> asset class. But before we do that, uh, could, could we just go back to that, to, to the intermediation, which you, you touched on uh, a minute ago? A lot of people involved. You've got these auction houses, you've got these dealers. Uh, you mentioned museums and galleries. You mentioned shippers. Uh, presumably, there is a warehouse where this stuff is 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 stored as well. So there are a lot of people standing between the artist who's creating the object and the collector who's buying the object. Is is there an opportunity here to 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 make that process of intermediation more efficient? Are we talking here about a disintermediation story, or are all these people doing things which are important and and valuable, and just they just need to do it a bit better than they are? Well, it's quite similar. The, the roles you talked about are quite similar to the roles which exist um, in finance. You know, I, I come from security services in my original background, um, and 
uh, you can draw parallels between shippers and custodians or storing that house and custodians. You have sales intermediaries in the form of auction houses um, and galleries who are similar to you know, broker, broker dealers um, or, or other types of sales intermediary. Um, and um, I've never been one that believes that you know, intermediaries exist purely because of some you know, fundamental inefficiency. You know, usually they're there for some reason, whether it's you know, matching buyers and sellers, uh, you know, consolidating information, um, for, um, that, that's quite specialised, uh, or fulfilling logistical functions, which are which are useful. So, you know, I, I think that is the case. Um, and and in, in the art world, you know, we talk about um, um, owners and agents. So the owners being um, museums or private collectors on the one side, and artists on the other. I mean, artists are creators, but obviously they own their works when they create them. Um, and um, you know, they have a they have a relationship. Artists need to distribute their works to collectors, and they may even have an ongoing relationship because there are certain royalty rights that, um, attached to works of art, which can be collected by artists going forward. So there are, there are parallels to the relationship between issuers uh, and investors in financial services. And then uh, yes, you have dealers who distribute works. You have auction houses that sell in the secondary market. You have uh, shipping companies and logistics firms that, that handle the movement and the storage of works of art. You have lenders, people lend money against um, art as collateral, particularly in the US, less in Europe. Uh, you have um, lending of art itself. You know, people, There's a very active process of, of, of collectors loaning works to for exhibitions or, or whatever reason. So there's an awful lot of transactional activity that goes on and it requires, you know, it requires finding of counterparties, it requires people to handle the movements and the specializations, and it requires financing. So all of those things exist. Um, and so we, um, I don't think we're trying to disintermediate those roles, but to your comment, there is, I think, a lot of scope to improve the efficiency and in particular the informational efficiency uh, with which um, uh, with which these transactions are, are managed, which gets back to the pro the question you opened with, which is the question of trust. Uh, which of those it was a very long list of of intermediaries you you mentioned there. I'm, I'm not even sure you included the insurers in, the, in that list, and I'm I, I'm convinced I'm sure they play a large part in this in this market as well. Who are you aiming to recruit as your customers? Is it going to be the the, the artists, the collectors? Was, or some subgroup of these intermediaries, including perhaps insurers? Um, so um, we, uh, as, I, as I think I mentioned, we, um, we, we recognize, well, so, so ArcClear, we haven't really talked about, it, is um, essentially a, uh, it's, an, it, it, it's, a, it's an information network for people who participate in the art market. Um, and, and we can talk about what that means in practice, but um, it, it's basically providing system of record for different types of, of useful information which can be attested to um, and linked back to individual physical objects, to pictures. So that's its basic proposition. And as such, um, um, we potentially are selling to all of those people because all of those people are participants in different types of transactions in the art world. Um, and you know, we, we by transaction, I don't just mean uh, buying and selling transaction, I also mean lending, um, you know, placing of work into the custody of another, whether that's you know, for storage or transit reasons, or whether that's because you give it to a gallery to sell, or whether that's because you lend it to someone um, for some reason, or pledge it's collateral even. So you know, there's a whole host of different transactions that people might uh, want to participate in, um, where um, it would be useful to have a very accurate uh, and reliable record of that transaction having taken place. Um, and so, um, our, our customer base is, is, is participant in art transactions, which includes both owners of works of art and their agents. And we make that distinction. Um, ultimately, owners are very important to us because they're the ones that choose to, to register a work of art. But we approach them with our, our sales channel is via the agents. So, uh, and by the agents, I mean principally the galleries and the shippers and the auction houses. Um, and that's a much more tractable group of people to approach than the very large numbers of collectors and, and artists. Um, so, um, uh, so, 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 so they're all potential users of ArtClear, um, but our, our principal sales channels are through those through those agents. Now, people like insurers are obviously very important in the market, as you mentioned. There's also a lot of legal uh, advice. Um, it won't surprise anyone, um, given that the art market is centered, uh, at least a large part of it, centered in New York, but lawyers play a big part in, in the art world. Uh, there's other, there's professional advisors of one sort or another um, working for collectors. 
uh, advising on, on, on histories and provenance. There's a whole host of experts, um, some of whom are employed by auction houses, some of whom are independent, who, who, can, who give their opinions about you know, whether works are genuine or, or, or all that sort of stuff. So there's, there's a much wider network of people who are also important to us and who influence the market, but our core customers are those people who participate in transactions. You're quite right to pick me up. We haven't really talked about what ArtClear actually does, uh, but if I understand it correctly from the, the documents which you've, you've shared with me, is you're looking to forensically scan works of art and then attach unique digital fingerprints, presumably some kind of cryptographic hash, to the actual physical object. Uh, a, is my understanding correct? And B, what's the real value of doing that to the art market and who really benefits from it? Um, uh, but so broadly, correct, our, our value proposition um, is to create a system of record of important data in the art market. Now, um, you, you know, we, we've talked about trust and um, the art market is fundamentally undermined by, uh, by the lack of trust. Um, and th there's the obvious trust issues, you know, forgeries and fakeries, which get ma made into Netflix documentaries and so forth, um, which are significant. Um, but there's a whole host of kind of lesser trust crime, if I can call it that, that goes on under the surface. And if you're in the market or if you spend any time looking at the market, you come across it, but it doesn't attract the big headlines. Um, so, um, for example, just last week, um, there was a case of Angela Gulbenkian, who is um, uh, married into the Gulbenkian family, which is a, a, um, a well-known um, and a very wealthy family, who's, who's gone on trial, accused of selling pictures that she didn't own. Um, so here's a classic problem of you know, how do you link ownership records to the object? There's no way to do that in the world today um, uh, beyond, you know, sort of tattered bills of sale from some auction in 1954. Um, so, so that's one set of problems. There's a guy in currently waiting a trial in New Jersey. Um, so I have to be careful what I say because he's obviously innocent, uh, called Inigo Philbrick, who is accused of, um, amongst other things, pledging the same work as collateral to different lenders, as well as selling half shares to several different people. Um, pictures. So again, you know, basic issues of ownership and trust. Um, then, of course, there are the, the forgeries, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and um, um, the upshot of all this is that you know, when you're dealing in art, you have to be very careful who you deal with. So reputation becomes everything. Uh, so you need to know who you're dealing with, or you need to be very confident in their in their kind of corporate reputation, which is why uh, the big auction houses, for example, maintain the position they do because uh, they they employ teams of experts to verify the authenticity of works, which can only also be done at a point in time. Um, you know, I can I can get someone to authenticate my work today, but then in t in a year's time, how do you know that it's the same work? And and you know, we we know of people who have very valuable collections which they have copied for insurance reasons. They put the real ones in a vault somewhere and they display the copies on their wall, but the copies are excellent. You know, there's, there's a whole industry in China, particularly producing very, very accurate copies of work for legitimate reasons. But of course, legitimate and illegitimate blend into each other. Um, sorry, I'm getting down, the, getting down the rabbit hole now. So, so there's this whole trust issue. And, and the, 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 the objective of ArcClear is to provide a data network which helps iron out some of these trust questions. And so what we intend to do is enable data about the history and provenance of a work to be linked to data about the ownership um, of the work, potentially to be linked to data about the condition of the work in its current state, all of which then links back to the actual physical object itself, the work itself, via this identifier and by the scanner, which you mentioned. And the scanner is a way of creating a unique identifier, which is physically unique. So it's derived from the, um, from the actual properties of the picture um, and yes, it, it comes out as a, a large alphanumeric string of however many characters, because um, um, it, it's a cryptographic key. But the point is that it can can be only derived from that picture. Um, and so by doing that, we're then able to link the physical object itself with data about its history and data about its ownership and data about its condition. And that enables you then to start to be much more confident when you're dealing you know, it, with people either whom you don't know or who you're not in, in, in who you're not in physical presence with, because, for example, if you imagine a sale overseas now, well, if you imagine a, an online sale who you don't know the buyer for, um, it now becomes quite possible to say that okay, this picture is genuine, or, or, or here's a picture; it's been certified as genuine by such and such an expert whom I trust or whose reputation I trust. Um, I can be confident that the buyer genuinely owns it. 
potentially I can see that it's now in the storage of uh, a, a well-known shipper, so they can act as a kind of escrow agent. All of that information can come together and I can confidently buy that picture now. And then I can take, uh, you know, the, the shipper can bring it to me. I can check its condition. If I'm happy with everything, then I can do a, a, an ownership transaction against payment. And all of the risk has then been eliminated from that transaction. So I no longer have to rely on a very expensive expert at a point in time. I can bring all that data together onto the network and facilitate uh, that kind of transaction. Um, so, so that's a slightly long-winded answer, but that, that's the basis of the ArcClear proposition. Well, you're describing a process which seems pretty basic to completing transactions. So this work exists, this, this person owns it, uh, and this person who's going to buy it is, is kind of good for the money. So how is the, how is the art market actually processing transactions today? Uh, it sounds like it's a very, very chaotic, um, complex, fragmented process, but give us some flavor of, of, of how ArcClear is going to make that transactional process more efficient. Well, you are right, it's chaotic and fragmented, and um, there is no formal, for example, mechanism of transferring title. Um, payments happen um, offline or uh, independent of, of, of movements. Um, and um, yeah, and there are regular problems that result. There's was, there was a recent case where the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam bought a constable picture from a London dealer, and uh, the payment was subject to wire fraud. It was six million dollars, I think, um, and was lost. And then they've been in dispute about who should pay the cost. And in the meantime, the Rijks Museum's got the picture. And um, um, so you know th these kind of things happen. And um, ArtClear essentially provides a mechanism for tidying all of that up and making it very clean. So, um, as I said, you can take an object, you can you can at your own, you know, you, you can you can find some experts that will attest to its authenticity, um, or maybe you've even bought it from the artist, and the artist's created a digital certificate at the point of creation, so you've now got proof that it's authentic. Um, and that proof is, is, is verifiable against the object itself using this digital identifier. So you, you can check whether that picture is genuinely the one which the expert uh, examined or genuinely the one which the artist signed for. Um, and then there is an ownership record attached to that, which, uh, which can be then, then be transferred um, cleanly. And because the ownership record can be transferred cleanly, it then becomes possible to link that to a payment, for example. So you can now do a delivery versus payment. And um, I mean, that's the basic, it's a basic, data function. Um, and then around that, you can build business processes which enable works to be um, moved and, and, and checked. So for example, um, as I said before, if I put my work into the custody of a shipper, um, you know, we can both uh, sign for that on the Arcland network. And now there's an audit trail that the shipper has my work of art. If then I sell my work of art to someone else, um, that person can now go to the shipper and say, look, I'm a genuine owner. Here's, here's, here's a record of that. And the shipper, and they, they have this problem a lot. They, 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 they can be confident to release it into, the, into the, the care of that person. If I lend my work to someone else to, to display, you know, we can track the transaction, or track, track the journey of the work as it passes from you know, various different parties. It can arrive at the museum, it's going to display it, and then it can come back again. And I can verify that the work I get back is the one I sent. And there have been cases where that hasn't been the case. So, um, so you know, all of these things become enabled by having this reliable shared uh, record system. Um, and then the other thing, just to say, because I'm sure we'll get into this, but you know, of course, this will be a distributed ledger system, uh, which means that we're not centralizing the data in a big in a central data store. We're providing uh, essentially a way of proving the provenance of data cryptographically so that because confidentiality is also a very, very important feature of the art market. People are very nervous about having information around their collections widely known. So we have to respect that. Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot of what you said, Angus, uh, resonates in a, in a blockchain culture, as it were, and we, we will indeed come to that. You've been very clear about uh, how you can assist with the history and provenance of works of art, proving that, proving physical possession, proving legal title, affecting title transfer, even doing delivery against payment. But um, in, in a financial services industry context, we'd also be worrying about things like counterparty risk. We'd be worrying about um, whether there are liens or charges over a work of art. Presumably owners do use these things as collateral for, for borrowing money. We'd also uh, be worrying about, you know, FATF recommendations on anti-money laundering and uh, KYC and countering the financing of terrorism and sanction screening and all the rest of it. Can you help with those areas as well with the 
with Leon's charges, counterparty risk, money laundering? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so um, we, when, when we talk about ownership, we actually think about ownership under five different headings. Um, so there's obviously legal title, which can be in whole or in part, and we can talk about fractionalization later. Mm -hmm. And there's physical possession. Um, so I, I may have my the work I own on my wall, or I may have it in storage, or I may have lent it to someone else. Um, there is um, liens, as you say, and, and art is pledged as collateral. Um, and there is no way at the moment of, of recording liens um, in, in any sort of central way. And, and as I mentioned before, Indigo Philbrick was exploiting or allegedly exploiting that um, uh, as part of his activities. Um, there's then two other facets. One is copyright. Um, copyright uh, is often retained by the artist. Um, it doesn't go when, when a picture is sold and potentially can be sold separately. And then there's also uh, artist resale rights. So uh, I think for 70 years, is it 970 or 90, after the death of the artist, the art, well, the artist and the, his or her estate is entitled to a payment when a work of art is sold. Um, and you know, with a system like art, well, in, in the world as it exists today, all of these things are quite difficult to manage. Um, with a system like ArtClear, they all become uh, easier to manage because we can record all of them uh, and track them as they go. So for example, yeah, we can track where a picture is, um, and, uh, and that can be independent of its ownership, which can be, and then we can, if a sale happens, we could potentially alert the artist's estate to enable them to collect their resale rights and so forth. So all of that becomes um, possible. And then we get to the question of, um, of, of AML, um, anti-money laundering uh, and identity more broadly. And um, it just happens that I think last year, 2020 was the first year in which the European money laundering directive applied to the art market. And it's come as a bit of a shock to them. They haven't had to worry about this before. Um, and, you know, it's a money laundering. There's obviously the identity of the person you're dealing with, you know, that basic KYC question. And then there's also the, the, the how they came by the picture. Um, and, you know, did they really find it in their granny's flat in Kazakhstan three years ago? Um, and um, obviously we, we can't sort of magically create history that, you know, pre-art clear, um, but what you can do is um, is uh, record kind of the you know who, who's the basis on which someone's um, sort of ownership has been established can can be recorded in art clear, and then from then on the transaction chains can move forward. So you can show that you bought it from a bona fide person, and so on and so forth. So it definitely starts to bring some structure and clarity to that um, to that problem within the industry. Mm -hmm. Now the people, the, the buyers and the sellers. Uh, Future of Finance, we're always looking for use cases for digital identity because we, we think it's a very important aspect of, of the future in financial services. Does or would digital identities help uh, in the art market? Yes, absolutely. Um, because, well, I, I, I mentioned online sales and, and, and the importance of trust. So at the moment, it's who you know. As much as what you know, is very much it, that's, that's the way the market operates. And you know, from an infrastructure point of view, it's still kind of, you know, it's still largely done on sort of backs of envelopes in wine bars. You know, that's kind of the extent of the, of the industry. But um, once you can, um, once you can have confidence about digital identities, not only can you start to um, resolve questions like um, like money laundering, you can also then, you know, for, from our Arclos point of view, you know, we, we may not, we, we won't get involved in saying whether the work is genuine. But if a if someone gets a, a, a respected professor to say it's genuine, we can record that. We obviously need to make sure that that professor is 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 who he or she says they are. So there's kind of that aspect of identity, um, and and um, so, so digital identity is pretty important. And then the other thing is, as as I kind of I've danced around a couple of times, the art market has not really embraced online um, activity to any great extent. I mean, it kind of until last year. It, um, online art sales had flatlined at about 6 billion uh, out of 65, so about 10%, but they hadn't really gone anywhere. They'd you know, risen up in, 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 in sort of 10 years and then flattened. And last year it jumped to 12.5%, largely as a result of COVID, which shut down all of the physical art fairs where a lot of the dealing activity happened. Um, but in the year before, in 2019, Hiscox published a, a survey of online art dealing and they kind of asked people who do or don't participate in the market, why, what concerns they had, and all of their concerns were trust issues. You know, how do I trust the buyer or the seller? How do I know that the work is genuine? You know, all those kind of questions which we've talked about before were what's genuinely holding back the market. And now we've got this slightly unstable position where people have been forced by COVID to go online, and yet none of those questions have been solved. Um, so they're actually having to expose themselves to, um, to risk which they weren't comfortable with before. Um, so 
that's that's kind of a, a key. Now, almost everything you've said uh, indicates the absence of some pretty basic disciplines around transactional activity not just online but 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 in general um so all of those uh, all of that lack of discipline inflates costs of course and, and one of the things i did notice in your, in your documentation is that transaction costs are very high in in the fine art markets 25 percent was the was the figure is there any scope for you after you've cleaned up all this this transactional um chaos is there scope for you also to reduce those transaction costs is that a benefit of of, of introducing some discipline to the process well, we, th we think it's one of the fundamental benefits um because 25 percent transaction costs are um are well i won't use the word outrageous but they're certainly very large i mean mm -hmm. again as i mentioned before I, I come from a security services background where 25 basis points is considered excessive yeah. um so um yeah, it, it's an immense charge, and it, it obviously holds the market back. And, and the reason it's there is because of this trust issue. Because if you, in order to get people to trust that your work of art is is genuine, you have to have it assessed by experts. That assessment has to be done on the actual expert at the point of sale. It can't be done done last year by someone else because you know uh, the risk of forgery and so forth. So you know you have to go to Sotheby's or Christie's who employ the experts who can then you know, give their opinion that this is a genuine Picasso, whatever the work is. Um, and then of course, um, they have the networks of people who trust them and they can bring together to get the sale price. So you know, the, the, the transaction costs are a direct um, consequence of the inability to establish a provenance independent of a sales process. Um, and once you can start to enable people to establish provenance, um, separately and, and link that to the picture, then you essentially open up a market in, in provenance and, and expertise, which is independent of the sales market. So sales commissions can, in fact, both markets can then become more competitive. So there's scope for independent experts to, you know, to, to sell their expertise and, and there's scope for, uh, for example, online or, or other types of transactions to come. And you know, you'd hope that once you open up things to competition, commissions and, and fees start to fall. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of scope to reduce transaction costs. Now, one person's 25% transaction cost is a high transaction cost, but to, to somebody else, it might be a very high standard of living that that 25% represents. Do you expect to run into resistance from certain intermediaries involved in the art market? Um, well, the answer is, oh, well, of course we will. I mean, if, 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 if we're successful in the way in, in doing what I just described, um, you know, that won't be universally popular. Um, mm. I suppose there's two three things you can say to that, which we which we do say to that. One is, um, but it's gonna happen anyway. Um, it's a bit of, you know, everyone knows that digitization has transformed um, in industries uh, which rely heavily on intermediaries and the art market has resisted it um, for genuine reasons. You know, I'm not in any way diminishing the, you know, the, the problems that, that, that are solved in the current structures are, are real problems. Um, but also the art market knows that, um, you know, ultimately you know, they, they're going to have to embrace some kind of uh, alternative digital future um, and that that's going to affect the, the industry economics. So there's a kind of one argument is it's inevitable at some point. Um, the second argument is um, that uh, although the costs, are, you know, the, the fees are high, but the costs are also high. I mean, the, 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 the costs of, of fraud um, and reputational damage are, 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 are high. And that's part of the reason that, um, you know, um, people need to employ very expensive experts. Um, and um, um, so, 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 so that's one thing. There's also a, just a tremendous amount of inefficiency. I mean, um, and as I've alluded to, you know, there's a lot of kind of lower level um, crime, fraudulent activity um, that sort of, you know, falls under the radar, but nevertheless is important. And there's also a lot of just genuine inefficiency. I mean, data isn't, there's, there's no efficient means to transfer data around. Everyone has to type things in every time they move a piece of work of art. So there's a huge, you know, there's a huge overhead. So there's, there's benefit from that. And then the third real argument is of course, the volume based argument, because 25 percentage point transaction costs, okay, they pay, they, they, they pay certain people's bills, but they also stop a lot of activity. And it means the art market is closed to a lot of people who would otherwise be potentially interested in, in participating in it because it obviously becomes hugely more expensive. Um, and so um, 
uh, which, which includes both you know, connoisseurs, people who are interested in works of art themselves, and also potentially financial investors who might be uh, interested in, 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 in holding art as an asset um, because of its financial characteristics. And, um, and so the, the other argument is that ultimately, if you can start to reduce transaction costs, you can compensate by growing volumes. And that was certainly the case um, in financial services, as, as I'm sure you remember, Dominic, um, you know, when, when he had fixed commissions pre-Big Bang, you know, that was very, very comfortable for the, for, for the old school stockbrokers. But this financial service industry is immeasurably wealthier now than it was in the in the early 80s because of the volume that's growth that's come through. So, um, you know, it, when we talk about art as an asset class, for example, it's never going to be realised as an asset class until you can drive transaction costs down to a more acceptable level. Talking of of fine art as a as an asset class, uh, we've been reading a lot and talking a lot about the possibility of tokenizing fine art. It's seen as an early use case along with real estate and privately managed assets for the application of, of the token technology, which has emerged from the world of, of blockchain and, and, and DeFi. Do you, um, A, see that happening and B, what, whether it is or not, what are the advantages which you see? You, you touched, for example, earlier on, on fractionalization and obviously fractionalizing works of art would, would make them more liquid. It's all very well. You can hang the painting on the wall and stick the the sculpture in your drawing room, but it doesn't really do much for you if you need to raise cash other than act as collateral for a loan. So um, on the face of it, it seems that it's ripe for, for, for tokenization and indeed fractionalization. Do you see that happening? And do you think the advantages are realizable? Um, it's certainly people are, uh, are attempting to do it. Um, and there's um, you know, several different um, credible uh, platforms attempting to, uh, to, to to launch that. Um, I mean, there's a, a Deutsche Börse who invested in 360X, which is um, doing precisely that. There's um, uh, a, another um, outfit in London called Mintus. Uh, there, there's, I think, Momart is one. So there's a, there's a bunch of people um, attempting to build that business model. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you, you can see why, um, given those characteristics uh, of art, you know, it potentially is a could be a useful part of an asset portfolio, of an alternative asset portfolio, um, and it could also be an, a, an interesting way of financing. And, and you know, one of the things that museums, for example, many art museums are, are strapped for cash, um, and that's only got worse because of their budget holes over the last year. So being able to um, you know sell shares in some of their works. Um, May, may be interesting to them. I'm not sure how it kind of realizes it ultimately, but um, but still, there are some. You know, there there are, there are two basic challenges um, that sit behind that kind of front end idea, um, which are you know, very equivalent to the challenges in the securities world. Um, so there's one is um, the fiduciary arrangements in which the work is held. Where is it? How do I, the token holder, verify that it's there? Um, you know, do I employ auditors or is there a better way of doing it? Um, and secondly, there is then, you know, ultimately, uh, if the value is to be realized, you know, the, the work of art itself has to be sold. And when your transaction costs are 25%, you know, that's going to be a big chunk out of anyone's financial return. So, um, so absolutely, it's a thing. Um, I think you know, it could be very attractive, but I think you've also got to solve these basic underlying questions of, of, of fiduciary arrangements, um, you know, uh, uh, custody, post-trade, data, provenant, all those things which you've been talking about are you know, amplified and important in this world of fractionalization if it's to be successful. I can see very easily how what you do is helpful to investors in tokenized, fractionalized works of art. But would, you, would you expect what you do to be able to support issuers as well? Those museums you mentioned, for example, you might want to raise some money on the back of some works of art they've got sitting gathering dust in the basement. Um, well, well, uh, I mean, I mean, yes, um, in the sense of you know, if if a museum was able to sell, I don't know, forty nine percent of their um, I've forgotten the name of an artist, think of an artist, Constable painting, um, picking one mm. earlier, then you know. That 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 is um, that could be a very uh, sort of attractive way of raising finance. Um, I mean, there's a question about about how the you know is there ever a repayment? You know, what does that mean um, at, the, at the end of the period? Um, maybe it's a way of um, um, 
maybe it's a way of internationalizing ownership of pictures there's, or maybe it's a way of mutualizing it between different museums there's lots of models that you could think about mm -hmm. um which could potentially fill uh, financial gaps um and then for artists as well you know there's potentially different ways of thinking about distributing their pictures um selling them to people to them to collectors so i'm sure they'll uh, th there's, there's plenty of scope for innovating in these kind of ownership structures and financing structures um if you can get the basic underlying infrastructure correct mm -hmm. And would that infrastructure include perhaps exchanges? You, you mentioned earlier how online sales of art have, have flatlined for a long time and Hiscock's uh, study, which showed that trust is the, is the biggest issue there. Could you imagine a, a, a kind of art market equivalent of, of, of Coinbase where these uh, tokens are issued and um, buyers and sellers um, transact in them you know, every day? Is that yes? I, I I think it's perfectly viable. Um, um, because you know these are um, these are liquid instruments. There'll be differing views about their value, which means there ought to be an active market in them. Um, there's a financial return attached to them. Um, so so yes, that, that's a perfectly um, uh, viable model. And as I said, people are trying to establish that now. I think you know to make it really viable, you need to be able to link it back to the objects, uh, and you need to have the ability at least to have a liquid market in the actual physical objects as well as in the tokens. You know, if if there's a market, if the if the physical market can develop, and the you know then the token market can become really liquid. It's you know, a bit like derivatives and, and underlying um, underlying asset markets. You know, if you've got liquid asset market, it becomes much easier to issue and price derivatives on the back of them. So you know, I think the two things can develop hand in hand. Uh, talking of artists and creation, are, are non-fungible tokens within the scope of what you're you're looking to do? They're not core to what we're doing. We're, our, our proposition is really focusing on the physical um, art market, um, but they kind of they're interesting. And um, you know, to the extent that to the extent that we're successful in establishing you know, this kind of idea of a, of a, of a, of a distributed system of record, and you know, artists start working in digital media, then you know you could see how the two things could come together. Now, the, the, the $64 million question, how do you expect to get paid? What's your, what's your business model here? You're obviously going to be renting these scanners. You can presumably charge transaction fees on those scanners. You can also charge for, for maintaining all the data, which you've, the complex data sets, which you've described. So to tell us, what's, how, how are you going to, to make money out of running ArtClear? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so our, our core value is the data network, and that will be the basis of our of our revenue streams. And so you're right; we can charge registration fees, um, uh, and then to fees for maintaining data and transactions um, uh, of different sorts. Um, and so that will be our core revenue stream. The scanners themselves, for us, are a vitally important part of our proposition because that's how we create the links. But they are enablers, so we would look to um, distribute those somewhere at cost. I mean, we haven't priced them yet, but yeah, we will look to cover our costs in manufacturing them or getting them made rather than setting up factories. Um, but not that's not our primary source of revenue. And we expect to charge, you know, we expect the cost of a scanner to be somewhere equivalent to the cost of a of an office photocopier. It's that kind of level. They're pretty crucial to your to your business model to generate those unique identities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we could. We could, you know, who knows if we will, but we could give them away because they are um, crucial to us. But um, at the moment, we're assuming we're going to kind of at least cover our costs with them. But the, the real value is once the data is there, um, it's in the transaction networks that you can create. Now, we're always looking for parallels between what's happening in this asset class or any asset class and what, what's going on in, in digital assets in the financial services industry. Are there Are there parallels between what, your scene, your own background includes time at, 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 at least one, not two financial market infrastructures, including a, a central securities depository. Are there parallels between what ArtClear is doing and what custodian banks and um, central securities depositories or financial market infrastructures more generally do in the, in the payments and securities markets? Or is this something completely new? No, no, it's very strong parallels. I mean, as, as you mentioned, um, I, my background is, well, I work for Euroclear, which is uh, where this idea um, so work is whilst working there, but this idea originally originated. Um, and I work for CLS as well. So uh, I definitely have a market infrastructure background and um, the parallels are strong. You've got um, issuers, artists and collectors, investors. So you know, you've got that 
uh, and you've got a chain of provenance between them. I mean, arguably, one of the functions of a CSD is to establish the provenance of the issue. You know, you, um, when, when, a, when, a, when a bond issue gets done, it gets deposited um, uh, in the common depository, and then you know, Euroclear and Clearstream become the primary records, and people trust that if Euroclear says, or well, um, there's 100 million in issue, that's the number in issue, so that helps you price them. So you know, that's a provenance chain. Uh, is, is this and, and as, as, as we spoke about art clear is kind of you know, fundamental you know, one of the one of the fundamentals is the provenance between the the object uh, and its history and the artist so that's one parallel and then the second is around the the um authenticity of transactions and ownership records which then takes you into the custody space because you know, custodians are obviously systems of records of ownership and managers of ownership transactions in various various uh, formats and uh, um um Art clear gives infrastructure for those functions as well, so it, it, it's a pretty exact parallel, albeit in a completely different um, sector. Now, those institutions are, of course, uh, looking at the possibility of investing in how they will be affected by by new technologies. Have you chosen your technology? You mentioned uh, distributed ledger, blockchain. So you've obviously made a choice at a high level, but have you made a choice at a at a low specific level? Are you using Corda or some other technology in particular. Um, where, where I guess we're, we're yeah. I, I guess we're relatively unusual in in kind of blockchain startup world, and we haven't built a blockchain yet. In most startups, start by building their uh, demonstrator, you know, show the asset goes out and it comes back again. Um, and we haven't done that, and it's because for us the primary proof point was can we establish this link between digital and physical. Um, the digital and the physical world. And that's where we spent our research uh, efforts. Um, and it, you know, it took us a, a long time actually to find the solution. And we spent a lot of time working on a prototype and getting it to the point where we're, we're really confident in it. And it's always been an article of faith that we could make the registry work um, uh, once we had that. Um, and but having said that, um, you know, I there are certain features that it has to, have, has to um, possess. It needs to be very confidential. Uh, it's essentially a facilitator for a set of bilateral transactions, bilateral high value transactions um, in a complex ecosystem. Um, and so that's colored our view of technology. And although we haven't, we haven't made a choice yet and we're kind of open to suggestions, um, we have a couple of uh, people who are advising us and, and will become our CT one of them will become our CTO when we get funded. Um, so we, we, we've done some thinking um, and, you know, we, 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 from my point of view, you mentioned Corda. I quite like Corda. I like R3. I've known them for a while. Um, I think the the parallels of the art market are quite similar to the way you know, the, to the, the problems Corda was set up to solve, which is you know managing high value uh, bilateral transactions in a complex ecosystem. So um, you know, I, I, um, and and because I've kind of spent more time looking at Corda than other systems. For various um, unconnected reasons, I kind of, you know, that definitely coloured my thinking and thinking about the functional design of this thing. But as I said, we haven't formally signed, we haven't signed any contracts or cut any code yet, so we, all options are open still. Mm -hmm. Now, are you doing this on your own, or are you operating in a in a crowded field? Are lots of organisations looking at solving the same problems as you are, or do you have this market to yourself? Um, not entirely to ourselves, but it's not hugely crowded either. Um, there are um, there are obviously a lot of people looking at digital technology in the art world. It, you know, it naturally attracts that kind of thing. Um, there are certain people. Uh, there are people who are offering scanning services, um, and most of those have been designed around um, you know, producing virtual viewing rooms, producing very high quality images of works of art themselves. And some of those people have kind of noticed that maybe there's a scope to sort of think about ownership records. Um, from our point of view, we think the problem they have is that the, the operational process of scanning is very heavy. Um, you usually have to go to their premises, maybe strip your picture down and take the frame off it and, and, and the glass, um, which means it you know, makes it very expensive. Whereas um, ArcClear, even our prototype scanner is portable. It takes a few minutes to do a scan. So there's a kind of operational heaviness, which we think is inappropriate. Um, and then on the other side, um, there are people who are you know, trying to create art registries. Um, focusing on the registry side, and either they have no way to link the object and the um, and and the record, um, which um, you know, 
we think is a fundamental um, mm. issue. Um, and uh, there's some slightly convoluted explanations which try to draw parallels with the fact that money is fiat and goes down all sorts of odd rabbit holes. Um, so, so, or, so, so that's one approach. Or people, there, there are some people who've kind of developed mobile phone camera apps and so forth, which sounds kind of quite sexy, but um, again, you know, from our point of view, and we've spoken intensively with the scientists that developed the technology we're using, which we've licensed from a very well-known um, um, global brand who developed it for different purposes. Um, you know, the, the 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 variability in your ability in, in scanning with a mobile phone, both in terms of the picture quality, but also you know the depth of field, pan, tilt, shadow, light, all these things mean that um, there's a probably an in our view, an unacceptably high chance of getting false readings, false negatives, but even more dangerous false positives. Um, and one, one of the reasons, uh, one of the fundamentals of our scanning technology is um, in, in laboratory tests, uh, it has less than a one in a billion chance of any false reading. It's really, um, really robust, um, uh, which is why we've chosen it. And we don't think you can create that with a mobile phone camera. And then there's also a business process angle because Again, if you're talking about a system of record of ownership, you need to have some kind of validation of, of ownership and snapping stuff with your mobile phone doesn't really give you much comfort. You know, I can walk into your house, Dominic, and quietly snap your favorite picture whilst I go to the toilet and suddenly claim it's mine. So, um, so you know, there, there, there's, there's a whole sort of, there, there's quite a lot that has to get wrapped around this idea of a basic, um, or, or, of a data registry, um, you know, which is kind of, uh, yeah, we think we, we because of our background, we have a quite a good understanding of these questions of provenance and business process and so forth, because again, custody is an operational business. Um, and then there's quite a lot of, of, of optical science that goes into the scanners themselves. So there's a lot of different things to pull together. And obviously, I'm talking my own, but but we don't think anyone else has come up with that combination of sort of usability and efficiency and robustness and and security that lets this become a viable proposition. Now, um, you, you mentioned you were seeking funding. How's that combination playing with investors and what sort of timetable are you are you working to to, to get this off the ground? Um, well, it's so far and we haven't got an offer of funding, so I'll just put that out there, but it's playing well. Um, and uh, uh, um, we've got some interesting avenues um, and we're hoping that we can close. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to say within this quarter, um, we'll see how, how long these things take. They can always take longer than you thought, but we'd like to be really hitting the ground kind of by the second, by Q4 of this year, uh, which would then mean that we'd be launching in the market and so the second half of next year. Um, so that's our kind of timetable. Um, so yeah, it's going well, but you know, we've still got to close, well, still got to sort of, you know, um, close out the deal and get the money and, and get going. So there's plenty of work for us to do yet. Uh, I was going to ask you how you how what you're doing will help. This is my last question. How what you're doing would help the art market grow? But I think you addressed that very clearly earlier on. If you get these 25% transaction costs down, the whole history of capitalism shows that your market will get bigger as a result of that. So you've been very clear about that. Now, what's the what do you think is the, the biggest barrier to your eventual success? Clearly, you've got to persuade a lot of people, you've got to build a substantial network and then scale. The, the technology that you have uh, and techniques which you have built. Um, what, what do you see as the biggest hurdle you've got to clear in order for this to become very successful? Uh, well, all of that really. Um, <clears throat> essentially, I mean, so we're, we're launching a new product into a new market. Um, so that in itself is a challenge. Um, we've got to develop that market. Um, and it's a network um, product. So, you know, the first, you know, having a user, one user, it doesn't really add a lot of value. So you've kind of got to have two sales before you've got anything worth having. Um, and you know, my background was product development um, in um, financial infrastructure, which is also networks. And I, you know, I know how difficult it can be to establish networks. And of course, in the long run, they become tremendously valuable. And if we can establish it, then it, you know, that's, that's great. But it, you know, the, the, the hurdles are high. And on top of that, we're selling into an industry which doesn't have a history of operating in this way. I mean, the idea of shared infrastructure it's pretty well established in, in financial services and you know, not, not only through organizations like, like Euroclear or CLS or exchanges or, the, or, or whatever, but you know, banks periodically get together and launch new stuff because it's for the mutual benefit. You know, there's kind of most recently, I suppose, proximity um, in the security space. You know, that was created by City, but then all of the other global custodians bought in because they recognized the value it was bringing to the table and it became a collaborative venture. There was a um, you know, Arcadia soft deal around derivatives processing um, a few years ago and so on. And um, 
so so yeah there is a kind of there's a way of doing these things in finance and that doesn't exist in the art world um you know, they, you know, obviously people know each other and they work together informally but there is no kind of a sort of history of formal collaboration and some of the players you know are very competitive so if you get one you lose the other and you know um we, we, which makes it harder so um so yeah i mean that that's the biggest challenge we've got is to launch a network product which is a challenge anyway into an industry which isn't used to thinking in those terms um so you know and, and I, yeah, that's a lot to do in our favor um as i kind of mentioned you know, the world is shifting in this way quite rapidly and i think covid's given a real kick um I mean, it was a real wake up call that you know they people just can't keep going on with these physical face to face meetings they need to find other ways of doing business nfts have you know also highlighted the the importance of the digital world you know concentrated people's um people's minds a little around this the introduction of anti-money laundering legislation again concentrates people's minds that this very informal way of working maybe isn't the best way to go forward um and you know some of the economics is is, is not you know it's favorable for the very big players in this, but it's not necessarily favorable for everyone so um so you know and 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 we've noticed in the conversation we've been having over the kind of years we've been working on this a shift from really interesting but is the art market ready to the art market itself saying yeah this is what we need um, so, um, and there's plenty of also, there's plenty of people who come out of finance into art who go, oh, you work for Euroclis. So, you know, um, so there is a kind of, a, it doesn't feel like it's an impossible task, but I don't underestimate it. it's quite a hard task. And then beyond that, there's just, you know, there's a whole host of product development roadmap from, you know, we've got one scanner, we've got a sort of, you know, okay, we'll turn it in, into production version. It only works on 2D objects. We want to be able to do 3D objects. There's, you know, there's whole questions of usability. There's, there's a million things we can do if we get fun well once we get revenue flowing to pay for our research budget so that'll get really exciting and it, it, there's a long roadmap in front of us but we need to get that network established first thank you scott thanks very much for talking to us